Hello, everyone, and welcome to Console Room Satellite 9. Uh, this is the Doctor Who Below Zero panel. And just for reference, we are recording this on January 1st in Minnesota. <laughs> And it is definitely below zero today. The National Weather Service is currently listing a temperature of minus nine degrees Fahrenheit or minus 23 Celsius for our friends outside the US. And that's with a wind chill of minus 27 Fahrenheit or minus 33 Celsius. So what a day. Uh, I'm Michael Zecca. I'm gonna be one of your panelists here. Uh, you'll see me on a lot of other panels virtually at the convention this year. I will not be attending in person, but you can find me in the Discord channel for live discussion if you wanna chat. Um, just to give you a little background for me, I did start off my career training as an astrophysicist, although I've gone off in many other directions since then. I do have a passion for meteorology and spent a couple of years working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research when I was a student in the climate modeling section. So when we talk about some of the climatic things, I might be able to contribute a little bit more science to the discussion. And uh, now I'm going to take turn it over to my other panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with Kathy. Well, I'm Catherine Tolton. I write YA. I've also done essays in books like in Children of Time, Outside In, uh, Chicksig Time Lords. And that's my basic background. Anne. And I'm Karina. Um, I am a nerd. Uh, that's my qualifications. I, I don't have anything to contribute to the science, um, just a love for Doctor Who. Uh, I am most familiar with New Who, uh, just so that everyone's aware. Uh, I haven't been able to stream uh, Classic Who. Uh, anyway, I am very excited for this discussion. I am um, disappointed that we are not having this discussion outside. Um, I really think that it could really uh, add to the environment of this discussion yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no no one's going for it no no not without a nice warrior armor nope yeah, I know. <laughs> well, our teeth will be chattering too much yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is the sound yeah. quality yeah well um before we get going on the discussion one thing i did want to uh mention is all well, the panel title is Doctor Who Below Zero. I think we need to think of that in terms of the Celsius scale, where zero is the freezing point of water. If we chose zero Fahrenheit, it would cut out a good number of the episodes we could talk about. Um, so, and, and I will just start off by saying when I was looking through all the various stories that might be relevant here, I was actually surprised at how few there were, that cold has not been a huge contributing factor to a lot of stories. Um, so we may ref reference some stories where cold was very tangential to the plot, but there are a few where it really is very important to the plot. And shall okay. we list them? Why don't we just start with one and discuss it? Okay. So why don't you pick one? Well, I basically would like, I, I know I'm kind of leave Karina, Katerina, Karina out a little bit because Keys of Marinus, part four, the snows of terror, where the doctor and are following the trail of various keys they have to collect, and they end up on a mountainside in a major blizzard. And they've got the, the idea depicted. They start talking about the, the problems of frostbite. And then they don't really take a long time on trying to relieve Barbara and Ian's frostbite. They have characters running around with skins over their shoulders and bare legs. Like, I'm sorry, if it's that cold, those poor people would not have been running around. So this Which is the Game of Thrones approach. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which doctor uh, is this? This is first doctor. Got it. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I basically wanted to point out, okay, they put some science in there, and then for the sake of the story, the writer totally forgets about the cold until they need to bring it back in again. Okay. And of course, it was all filmed at a soundstage too, so yeah. you're not exactly seeing cold breath or anything. Yeah. 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 So you want to pick another one? Well, um, I'm going to talk about really one of my favorites in terms of where the cold comes into play in the plot, and that's the Waters of Mars, the David Tennant special set on Mars in a in a base. 
Now, granted, it's pretty warm in the base, and you do see the they're dressed in pretty much everyday clothing inside. But Mars itself is a very cold planet. It is a cold desert, uh, a, a high, hot day at the equator in the summer might reach above zero degrees Fahrenheit, barely. But at the poles on Mars, you are talking those polar ice caps are not water ice. Those are primarily dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. It is that cold. So uh, the flood is a virus that, of course, it, uh, impacted the Martian civilization and sent the ice warriors off world many years before, has been frozen in a glacier under the surface of Mars from at this point, what, probably millions of years. And they've tapped into this glacier as a water source. And by thawing it, it is now becoming a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting how the flood, the virus, is like it's as simply, um, simply because of a broken filter. Like yep. that's all that was needed to <laughs> to mm -hmm. filtrate that out. Um, yet that that filter was crucial and critical. Uh, and, and this is something that NASA actually has to think about when we talk about doing like. Uh, manned mission to Mars or, or even a colony on Mars, you want to be able to find a water source there to keep replenishing things. I mean, they do as much as they can to recycle what they've got, but eventually it's a and lost game. But they're going to really have to think about this because if there is any biological organism living on Mars, we don't know how it would affect us and we wouldn't want that coming in through the water supply and affecting us. Um, We've we've seen what's inter happens when viruses cross species and start infecting. Uh, we've seen a little bit of that the last two years, and you you don't want that to be rampaging through a uh, small contained base like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Kathy, you got anything to say about Waters of Mars? Yeah. You guys covered it quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I think possibly my one of my favorite um, below zero episodes is Amy's choice of mm -hmm. the Eleventh Doctor and Amy and Rory, um, and they're split between two dream worlds of back on Earth and Amy's very pregnant, um, and then back in the TARDIS where they're they are um, getting sucked in by a cold star, correct? um and so the TARDIS is essentially freezing inside then you have the whole poncho boys um which is probably one of my favorite lines I think it's fantastic <laughs> um but it was very well depicted yeah absolutely I think I think that's one of like the most realistic in terms of like depiction of being cold uh trying to use layers um to stay warm i think um the tardis probably has more uh warm clothing than just ponchos uh but uh that said they i think they do a good job of of keeping that um that realistic that we know as minnesotans uh you need to have layers Players are good. <laughs> I mean, so do we want to get into uh, like any of the the plot elements of of these uh, episodes, or are, do we really want to stick to the cold elements of the episodes? Well, I mean, where the cold plays into the plot, that's an important thing. Because there were several episodes okay. where snow was in the background, but it had nothing to do with. The whole plot yeah I, we've had christmas specials many a year um it's questionable in some cases just how cold it is it certainly wasn't cold when they filmed them <laughs> um but there are a few of the christmas specials where the cold does come more into play the the most prominent i think being the snowmen mm -hmm. and that's where the great intelligence is actually <laughs> using the snow as a medium uh, and twice upon a time mm -hmm. kind of sort of when they're at the North Pole, South Pole? Um, well, Twice Upon a Time is tying back, of course, into the last Hartnell story, The Tenth Planet, and that is set in 1986 Antarctica. 
so we're at South Pole. Okay. Yeah, and it gets quite cold and quite windy and quite dangerous uh, outside and of McMurtry. Watching the snowflakes so freeze was a really dramatic effect. Oh yeah, frozen in time mm -hmm. in that case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, and of course, so again, uh, twice upon a time, it, it's sort of just at the beginning and end because it ties into basically pulling Hartnell out of the 10th planet for another story. <laughs> but then that can tie us back into talking about the 10th planet where the cold really does come more into play. So you have a, an early warning base in uh, South or in, in, in Antarctica research base there, and they discover this other planet, Mondas, approaching, and then there's cybermen landing this is our first cyberman story and the cybermen are pretty well suited up against the cold so they're able to kind of siege the base and so on and then start their nefarious plans to do things to the earth and the doctor foils it so with the help of ben and polly <laughs> but then you also uh, have the historical ones like mm -hmm. the nice where mm -hmm. you get the actual effects of the Thames River freezing a thick mm -hmm. enough that an elephant can be on it. Yeah, and then this is a common thing back there. They, you know, they mentioned in the story that it was the last of the frost fairs that year, but, the, but prior to that, it's been going on for years where they were holding these fairs on the Thames. And this is a real thing. So there, there was a period in uh, the North Atlantic. So Europe, uh, the Eastern seaboard of the United States, and especially the Northern half, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, that were experiencing an extreme cold period for several hundred years. It's it's known colloquially as the Little Ice Age. And there's argument about when it started and why it started, but anywhere from the 13th century to the 17th century, early 17th century, this began and it carried through until the early 1800s um, with periods where it was colder punctuated by different major volcano explosions around the world. The Krakatoa explosion very much affected things. Mount Tambora in uh, 1815 went off and uh, created what we know as the year without a summer in 1816, which actually ties into the plot of the haunting of Villa Diodati, which is the episode with uh, Mary Shelley and the Cybermen uh, with the partial face. Um, it wasn't quite below zero there obviously but it was quite a cold summer and it caused crop failures and the whole thing and it really affected uh humanity but even um in our own country uh, during the american revolution we hear those stories about george washington holed up at valley forge in these extreme cold temperatures and all and again it was part of this little ice age period it was just generally colder it was a period of climate change that actually dipped colder and a large reason that we got out of it was the industrial revolution uh, we human enforced climate change warmed the planet even in the 1800s <laughs> and we're set, definitely seeing the effects of this now my sister had to evacuate from her house two nights ago because of fires in the uh, boulder colorado area or in boulder county uh, in december uh, we had tornadoes in southern Minnesota two weeks ago, mm -hmm. which is unheard of in Minnesota in December. It's never been recorded before, and there were at least 15 of them. So um, yeah, but back in this period of thin ice and, and the haunting of Villa Diodati, we definitely had a period of, of colder temperatures, harsher winters. And you could do things like have the frost fair and have elephants out on the ice and tents and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to those historical moments with Mary Shelley and the ice fair, um, really just kind of bring a point home of, of both climate change and um, and just influence of weather on the planet and in Doctor Who um, and how they can kind of craft. One thing I love about Doctor Who is their ability to craft um, in plausible, well, sci-fi plausible stories for um, seemingly uh, weird or interesting events um, in history and, and kind of taking control of that narrative and finding um, an alien reason for it most of the time. Um, and I think that's something that they do really well um, as, some, as a literary uh, uh, nerd as well as a 
Doctor Who nerd. Um, I find I loved that they were finally able to get to um, the story of Mary Shelley in the year without summer because I find it fascinating. Um, and I think that was, I agree, it's not below zero, but it's definitely um, not average and, and cold, but it, it, it crafted some amazing literary work, uh, which I think is uh, fantastic. <laughs> Mary Shelley, the mother of science fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also interesting how often the Doctor Who writers revisit Antarctica. So we've had the 10th planet, we've had Seeds of Doom, we've had um, Last Christmas. Mm. So visiting Antarctica several times. Wasn't Last Christmas set at the North Pole? Was it the North? Okay. Because of the whole Santa Claus tie-in? Mm. you're right you're right okay yeah but still it's a poll yeah. so yeah 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 well in, in antarctica there's there, i mean when seeds of doom i was going to say there's a good reason that antarctica is a part of that story seeds of doom is heavily ripping off the thing so which was also set in antarctica <laughs> so it's that period of doctor who history where we ripped off all the classic horror films um you know we, we did a frankenstein episode we did a vampire episode we did a mummy episode we did yeah 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 and they are finding different uh things buried under the ice nowadays so mm -hmm. yeah well antarctica <laughs> was a very thriving continent at one point in you know, the earth's history i mean first of all it wasn't always at the pole Yep. Uh, due to you know uh, tectonic drift and so forth, uh, it has not always been at the pole. But also, the the Earth was quite a bit warmer in the you know, Cretaceous and the, even the early uh, Mesozoic and so forth. Uh, there yeah, are plenty of life forms mm -hmm. living under the ice. So mm -hmm. We're still finding new species we didn't know were down there. So. I think one example of that in Doctor Who is uh, Cold War with mm -hmm. uh, the 11th Doctor and Clara, um, where Russian um, operatives, scientists uncover uh, a ice warrior um, and they're on a submarine ship bringing it back to Russia. Yep. Um, and again, so that was discovered in polar ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I like how they're able to, to take those moments, um, mm -hmm. and, and like the, the plot of it is set in, in a submarine and it's not like they're all freezing cold below zero, but it is, they're taking the villain, the, the antagonist, um, and, and the basis is in ice below zero. Mm -hmm. yep. and we definitely see the ice quite well toward the end of the episode when they uh surface and uh connect mm -hmm. with the uh ice warrior ship rescuing him and then find out yeah. the tart is actually transferred to the south pole yes <laughs> yes so there we got antarctica going again yep. and this was in 1983 <laughs> i believe so a few years before the events of the 10th planet And that just, I always want to say about Thin Ice, there's such a wonderful group of actors in that story. Uh, you know, you've got um, Liam Cunningham as the captain of the sub. Uh, you would know him better probably as Davos on Game of Thrones, but he's done a lot of work and a lot of other things. Oh, and of course, David Warner. Oh my gosh. Yeah. David Warner's and everything. Yeah. And Thin Ice him. or Cold War? Cold War. Sorry, Cold, Cold War. War. Yeah. Yeah mixing up my name sorry you mentioned two plots the other yeah we've also had let's see uh well we're talking about ice warriors we might as well talk about some of the other appearances of the ice warriors uh first of all there was the original well. mm -hmm. ice warrior story back in the patrick trout era which again involved a frozen ice warrior found near the poles and or actually i think this is isn't this set during a period in the future where we have another ice age creeping yes, in so we have glaciation and so forth. glaciers yeah right and it's found within the glacier and and stirs up trouble and uh so cold war was in many ways calling back to that 
Because, I mean, we've had other episodes with Ice Warriors, but not usually associated with Ice, because Peladon, basically, they were just basically visitors. Yeah, but... Peladon was a little bit colder, but it wasn't quite below zero. No. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, right, the, the Ice Warriors were visiting. And one thing I did love about the Peladon story, since we're mentioning that, is that the Ice Warriors are not always the antagonist. Yeah. Sometimes they're the good guys. In Cold War, because yeah. mm-hmm. he was a hero, and his daughter, who rescued him, basically took pity on the poor sub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I I like the idea that you're right. The the ice warriors aren't always the antagonists. I think often they're just misunderstood and have a very rigid um, moral code uh, that people who don't who do not know them do not understand and uh, humans being very uh, aggressive often <laughs> uh, and defensive creatures are uh, often uh, and very trigger happy uh, <laughs> at least in Doctor Who um, uh, kind of make those fatal mistakes that, that result in um, ice warriors uh, becoming the antagonist they'd only just listen to the doctor <laughs> And again, that comes into play again in the Empress of Mars, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Again, listen to the doctor on this. He understands their culture better than the others do. Uh, and there is an element of the cold in Empress of Mars. Underground, the city is warm enough, but obviously when Bill and the doctor were up on the surface arranging those stones, it was quite cold there. <laughs> those are heated spacesuits. <laughs> Uh, tan- tangent, I'll just tell you, the, the Mars rovers um, that we have on Mars now do an interesting thing. Um, I was at a NASA teacher workshop some years ago, and Jeff Landis brought in the Mars Pathfinder prototype mm. to show us. Because they, when they build the rovers, they build an extra one. The original prototype, they keep on Earth and use it to do test runs to figure out how to program and send the thing around. And I asked him, I said, so, you know, we got this phenomenon with car batteries freezing up in Alaska and such. So how do you keep the batteries on these rovers from freezing up? Because I know they're powered by solar panels. And he said, well, we pour the waste heat from the motors back into the battery to keep the batteries from freezing, to keep them warm. And you reach a point in the life of the thing where there's so much of the Martian dust that accumulates in the solar panels that they don't produce enough electricity to keep the batteries charged overnight because they have to leave the motors running overnight in order to heat the battery and eventually the batteries freeze up and that's when you lose the rover wow yeah as we did so science yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. it makes you wonder how um the uh how Great Britain was able to get to Mars in I, I can't remember the year 18 17 or yeah, that, well, that they well hijacked an ice warrior vessel back yeah. there. Yeah, true. Yeah, I mean fr- Friday basically got them there. I think yeah. is the idea, right? So he got their assistance to repair his craft so he could get back. Mm-hmm. And they just took advantage. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and he took advantage of them. I mean, it was it was a little quid pro quo there. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like uh, um, blanking on the Centaurans' name, but the one from the Ice Warrior. Um, stuck back in medieval England, but utilizing, you know, these primitives and their materials to fabricate the parts he needed to repair his spacecraft. Oh, Time Warrior. Yeah, Lynx. Yeah, yeah, Time Warrior. Yeah, Lynx. That's the one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So other ice, let's see, we've got the Abominable Snowman, Mm -hmm. which we've got the Great Intelligence, basically Mm -hmm. comes back again in the Snowman. Mm -hmm. We're having these nice links back and forth between Classic Who and New Who. Yeah. Great writing. Well, it's not that the writers of the new series were fans or anything. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so in the abominable snowmen, we've got the great intelligence uh, running these robotic Yeti around the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. And it's quite cold up Mount Everest, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And so the snow definitely played in there. Uh, we see mm-hmm. the doctor wearing a quite furry coat in that story. And Jamie and Victoria bundled up a bit, although weren't Jamie's legs more exposed in that? Yeah. And, yeah. and I don't think they were wearing hats. Well, there are college students around Minnesota who tend to have bare legs as soon as it gets 40 degrees. So I was like, mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and Jamie did grow up during the Little Ice Age in Scotland, so I suppose he's go. used to a bit of cold. So, uh, yeah. just like hardened yeah. Minnesotans. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I definitely after seventeen years here, I'm more tolerant of the really cold temperatures than mm -hmm. I used to be. Growing up yeah. in Colorado, we rarely saw a zero degree Fahrenheit reading, and it, they didn't last long. And now that's just like normal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then we have those stories where they rely on either cold weather or ice to as a part of the story. So you've got Planet of the Daleks where they're relying on an ice volcano to keep yes. the Daleks frozen. You've got Attack of the Cybermen who were using the cryons on Telos for their own freezing operation. Which ties back into Tomb of the Cybermen when we had Cybermen frozen and suspended animation. Right. So yeah, I, I wonder the cryovolcano idea was really cool, um, especially for 1973 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. We have cryovolcanoes in the solar system. Yeah. Okay. You gotta realize when you get cold enough, water makes good rock. And when it gets warmed up, it is a type of magma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so you look at a, a, a moon like Europa or Ganymede around Jupiter, and water ice is the main rock making those worlds up. Europa is known to have a subsurface ocean with a frozen shell over it. It's rather like Lake Minnetonka in the winter. <laughs> okay. And so there is a lot of thought that there might be life in that ocean. Uh, there's also a certain amount of tidal heating uh, from Jupiter and the other moons that may keep the center of the world warm. So the ocean may actually be a little bit warmer underneath than it is under the ice on top. Uh, when you get into the outer solar system, uh, li liquid nitrogen can start to freeze. And so you actually have a nitrogen cycle on Pluto, the way you would have a water cycle on Earth or a methane cycle on Titan. Um, so different substances can make different rocks. So these cryovolcanoes actually do exist out in some of those outer moons and stuff in the, in the outer solar system. Which basically shows that Doctor Who writers do rely on science. Sometimes. Sometimes. We won't get into the other. We, no. We're not talking about Kill the Moon oh, today. No. <laughs> we do that in other panels. Yeah. Yeah. But then you've also so, got, let's see, Planet of the Oud, and, uh, which is basically the way their planet is. I, I, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and, and there's a the thing too. Yeah, go ahead. In sci science fiction, sometimes there's this tendency to imagine that the whole world has the same climate but do we know that with the Oods planet or did they just happen to live in the colder climate if they you were know, uh, there's out there yeah some species just pref are, are adapted to certain niches mm -hmm. so polar bears don't tend to live at the equator <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on earth and so the Ood may just live in the northern climes or the southern climes that are are colder or because they were kind of enslaved where they push that direction that could be too. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and and then you, you think about the fact that like all the oud all wear clothes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, of some sort. And so I wonder if if that was the original state, if they had created clothes, um, mm -hmm. or if if those were you know part of being enslaved, um, and if so, I mean, in terms of temperature, how are they keeping? themselves um and if in if that that coordinates to a um colder climate yeah. right if they've adapted and how they've adapted mm -hmm. is it weird that i want to say like i want to see the ouds naked because <laughs> i want to see I, I mean i want to see like their environment and how they've adapted <laughs> to that cold weather if it is in fact their native climate well, and interesting enough, so the Oods are holding their secondary brain or whatever in their hand, and that's mm -hmm. being exposed to that level of cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that brain must have some interesting adaptations. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let's see. Other ones we've got are Dragonfire. Mm -hmm. this, Dragonfire this? and Ice World. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was clear. The planet was called Ice World, and obviously there were ice caverns and everything yeah. but and the magma beast mm -hmm. 
And can you tell me about that since that's okay? That was the seventh doctor story. Mm -hmm. We picked up Ace and, and got rid of Mel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and introduced Sabalom uh, Glitz. Mm -hmm. But we, the main villain, no, sorry, brought him back. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, yes. But the main villain needed to be kept at sub zero temperatures mm -hmm. because when he was actually exposed to heat, he melted. Yep, a lot like Nazis and Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark. <laughs> but we also had that ice dragon wandering around. Mm -hmm. Right. And again, this could be one of those icy outer moon type things um, that they've sort of terraformed a base into. Yeah, because so. the visitors who were standing in the ice shop and getting ice cream drinks and Ace was basically serving milkshakes, mm -hmm. dumping them on customers. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. It was probably more cold, not extreme cold, in the base. You know, well, no, you probably they probably weren't warm to seventy degrees. But, areas. The the people yeah. lived on the cold side, and yeah. all the visitors were not bundled up. Yeah, could be that though that they're hardy Minnesotans that are just adapted. So it's you know it's fifty degrees Fahrenheit. They're good and just shirt sleeves, mm -hmm. you know. Because I mean, I, I usually break the shorts out when we hit about. 55 60 so nowadays okay, only 50 only 50 i'm like i take off my jacket and like wear and like t-shirt and yeah. like 40 <laughs> at least in the spring yeah. at least in the spring right after you've yeah. had that cold winter yeah um now so go ahead no go ahead rebo's operation was filmed well was set in a planet that was actually during their winter mm -hmm. we had people bundled up a lot yes Yes, oh, yeah, and, and it was a classic Robert Holmes story with interesting characters and it was the beginning of the key to time season. So this is the introduction so, of the first Romana. Yes. For that episode. Yeah, so she was dressed up in like white furs and stuff in that one, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. And of course the doctor is well, the, the Tom Baker doctor in that period is well suited for the cold weather with his with long scarf. layers <laughs> and his scarf and everything. Uh, there are the stories about him wrapping Louise Jameson in the scarf between takes when they'd be filming these, you know, outdoor location shoots and some, you know, qu gravel quarry somewhere where it was 35 degrees. <laughs> and she's freezing to death in those little leather skins. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's a, that, that is a turn that we can take of going beyond the uh, below zero episodes and going into below zero freezing or um filming i should mm -hmm. say um and maybe i mean oh, are there are there episodes. particular episodes <laughs> <laughs> there would be too many episodes because yeah. you can't train about the gravel pits being really cold well and it, it, it depends on what time of year they're filming because i know in the modern era they've done a lot of their filming in the summers mm -hmm. you know spring mm -hmm. summer fall and so all these christmas episodes have been filmed in like august uh so we haven't been able to get that good snow thing going on, but I can think of Blake Seven, which was filmed concurrently with Doctor Who back in the 70s. And there were so many shots in those gravel quarries where you can see snow on the ground in that series. Um, I have a feeling that they were filming a few months out from when Doctor Who was in the same locations and it was probably colder when they were filming. So, yeah, yeah. Well, then I know I, I find it interesting when you have to, uh, you know, film in the film a winter scene in the summer and you're like sweating and the, the effects that they have to do to, to make it not look like you're sweating <laughs> and a lot of dabbing of the forehead. Um, but then I also find it interesting on the opposite end of when they're trying to film a, a summer scene and it's in the very cold and they have to like suck ice cubes so that you don't see their breath. Um, and kind of elements that they or effects that they have to do to get that um, not cold scene. Or they basically add in a little thing like the weather is going weird. <laughs> like in the Claws of Axos. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the Claws of Axos was an interesting one. They, they were not intended to have snow as part of that story, but there was a freak snowstorm in the middle of filming. And because they don't film the thing completely in sequence, <laughs> the snow pops up and it goes away and it pops up and it goes away. So they had to throw in a throwaway line 
where it was like Corporal Bell or someone saying that there were freak weather conditions in the area of where the Axos uh, ship had landed uh, caused by the ship, just to explain away the you know, rain one day and snow the next and then sunny skies the next <laughs> as they were filming the story. Oh, yeah. yeah. Creative writers, yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. You know, we mentioned uh, cryogenic suspension, suspension animation in terms of the Tomb of the Cybermen and some other stories. I think we forgot okay. to mention the Ark in Space. Um, and whether it was cryogenic or not, it's hard to tell, but that's usually the science fiction trope when it comes to yeah. suspended animation. But the space station that they were in wasn't cold except for the vaults. And even when yeah. they were standing there in the vault, you, they didn't seem to react as if it was cold. So yeah. Still, I, I found in my own viewing of the series as I've gone back, that's the moment where Sarah Jane Smith's personality changed. Up until Ark in Space, you know, she was a much stronger character and she became more of the screaming companion after coming out of the freezer in Ark in Space. Mm -hmm. There's a real sharp difference in the writing for her character at that point. Well, the trouble is you also had Harry Smith too. So they were trying to make her a little bit different from her normal yeah. self. But right. having the doctor taunt her to basically mm -hmm. get her to crawl through the tunnels was no Cring like that. cringy. Yeah. A little bit cringy. Yeah. yeah. I'm very glad she hit him a couple of times after she got out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kathy, I remember you mentioned the hand of fear. Want to talk about that one? Yeah, because Eldred's now this is again, this is the last episode with Sarah Jane Smith. She finds they find a stone hand in a in a quarry, and it's a creature that comes from a planet that has been hit by climate change. So basically, so when they go to Eldred's planet, it Castria. is I see. Totally icy. Yeah. And the doctor yeah. has furs and for coats in the wardrobe. Well, I remember when they saw the recording from one of those last surviving Castrians. Uh, he's, he's bundled up in furs and such, uh, you know, freezing in this cold station. Yeah. Uh, and interesting that so the Castrians, like Eldred, were uh, silicon mm -hmm. based, they're silicon based life forms. So this is something that has been posited as, you know, so all life on Earth is carbon based, mm -hmm. you know, organic. It's organic chemistry, organic chemicals have carbon at the center of them. And when you go down the periodic table, silicon is the next one down below carbon. So it has some of the same properties, though so acts a little differently. So it's been posited that you could have silicon based life forms. And so this is why Eldred was a stone hand. Yeah. <laughs> it literally was made of stone. Which was a um, great addition to the writing team they could basically posit other forms of life but then they could also throw yeah. in a huge mention of climate change because it turns out eldred yeah. was the person who had basically taken down the barriers against the cold mm -hmm. didn't like his people yeah yeah power mad yeah that's yeah. another well uh, and, and okay, so I want to drift away from the TV episodes for just a moment. I know we don't mostly we want to stick to TV episodes on panels, but there is one big finish audio that really stands out for me when it comes to the cold that I really think we need to mention. And, and this is Mark Platt's story, Spare Parts, which is essentially Genesis of the Cybermen. It is set on Mondas during the early development of Cybermen. And so this is Mondas after it's been torn away from the solar system. It is freezing out they're living under the surface the surface of the planet is too cold the atmosphere is freezing out and the initial and and they're doing more and more cybernetic uh modifications to people as medicine but they start to use these adaptations to be able to go to the surface and try to reclaim the surface and this is the development of the first cybermen of course they make the mistake of removing the emotions and things and that causes problems but uh the cold is very much a part of the plot in that one yeah 
Which was interesting when they yeah. finally got to the 12th Doctor and we had I'm blanking on the Missy episode where we basically meet the Miss, Missy and the Master. Um, mm -hmm. Is that the uh, is it World Enough in Time? Is that Thank you. The name of that one? Yeah. So it's a different evolution of the Cybermen. But yeah. they end up with the same result. Well, and I kind of in my own mind, I, it, I'm thinking that the Mondasians on that spacecraft left Mondas somewhere probably shortly before the events of Spare Parts. So they had the same medical techniques available and made the same mistakes okay. is the way I look at it. And and then, of course, over with the uh, black hole causing the relativistic distortion between one of the ship and the other times moving faster at one end of the other so the development of the cybermen their evolution happens faster at one end of the ship and yeah i always found that the, the whole concept is so interesting and so um amazing but it's also one of the hardest uh episodes or series of episodes to watch uh i uh, uh bill potts just it, it's such a sad ending for her um that yeah, yeah my heart always breaks. I think I think in some ways that was that was and also Jackie Tyler's uh, cyber conversion in the rise of steel is mm -hmm. inspired by a moment in Mark Platt's spare parts there's a uh, so this was a story of Peter Davison and Nyssa visiting Mondas and there is a young woman that they encounter their family they encounter and she is cyber converted partway through the story and they encounter her after she's been converted mm -hmm. but the emotion stuff hasn't been removed yet so she's you know suffering inside that suit well and the same and, thing and with see, danny see pink. That with bill we see that with jack yeah we saw that with danny pink too yeah yeah i mean there's a reason the, they, they ultimately you know took away the emotions and so forth from the cyber because they are in so much pain living like this yeah. well yeah. it it just reminds me in the the bill pot series where <laughs> instead of you know dealing with the pain of the patients they just turn down the volume of of them screaming mm -hmm. and and saying i'm in pain and i'm i'm hurting um, which again is, is sad and is a yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Both, okay. talk, both that big finish audio and that particular story is so powerful mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Well, and my understanding at one point uh, when they were developing the rise of the Cybermen in Age of Steel for uh, David Tennant, I think Russell basically wanted to adapt spare parts, but he didn't <laughs> manage to get the rights. And so uh, they had to go in a different direction, but you can still see where there's a few pieces of the story that are inspired by it. When you, so. when you consider that when they first wrote The Tenth Planet, uh, the writer, at, I'm blanking on his name too. Kit, Kit Pedler and yeah. Jerry Davis. So and Jerry Davis was the story editor. It was because of the fear of just transplants in general. Because yeah. that's what was happening in the medical field at the time when that story was written. And right. they took it a whole different direction over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Kit Pedler was a, a scientist, I think a cyberneticist, who, uh, who did some science consulting for Doctor Who that would collaborate with Jerry Davis on stories. And yeah, that's how the Cybermen came about. Yeah. A little tangential, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kathy, there were a couple more Hartnell stories on your list that we uh, haven't gotten to. Well, basically the Roof of the World, which is a Marco Polo episode, but because it's really hard to see. I mean, if you've got the telesnaps, you can watch it, but it's like, mm, there's not much there. And that was just the first opening episode of when they land in the Himalayas and the TARDIS malfunctions so that they are freezing inside. And that's how Marco Polo got his hands on the ship. And we also- And then they, they caravanned across Asia from there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that was about, so the only uh, first Doctor episodes I've got is Marco Polo one, the Keys of Marinus, and the Tenth Planet. You mentioned the Cave of Skulls to me. Well, that wasn't two. okay. So that was the second episode of the first Doctor, mm -hmm. but the it was actually when you look at it, 
you think it's snow, but it's actually sand. And at one point, Ian goes, oh, the sands are freezing. But, and that was the whole beginning of why the doctor was captured by the cave people because they wanted fire and they saw him lighting this pipe. I think the doctor probably gave up smoking after that. But in the case of Skull, you really didn't see any snowfall. It was just basically they were approaching the cold times mm -hmm. because you didn't have any problem with anybody saying that they're very, very cold. Mm -hmm. so that I think quite see that one qualifying. Well, again, uh, 100,000 BC, I mean, we're into the ice ages at this point. And this could be summer, but it's still not that warm. Yeah. And they're cold adapted, but they having fire there. would mm -hmm. adapt you better. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I, mean, cold. I think the cold plays oh, yeah, I think the cold plays into that even if it's not snowing. Yeah. Yeah. So all how right. how has um kind of bringing it all together, how do you think that um having below zero episodes has um has gone in terms of like identifying and, and discussing and acknowledging climate change and kind of the changes in climate. Um, we have some historical episodes uh, with it, which is very nice in terms of mm -hmm. uh, just combining it all together. But I mean, there's definitely episodes that kind of hint at the, the results of climate change. Yeah. Well, Ice Warriors was basically because the planet was in an ice age. Yeah. And yeah. Then that, again, that was during the time period when we were actually starting to acknowledge the fact that climate change there. Mm -hmm. You've got the hand of fear with the Eldred basically causing the ice change. Um, mm -hmm. Seeds of doom because Antarctica is when you're actually finding things buried there. Um, yeah, I think I think hand of fear probably is your best example of really speaking to climate change in a metaphorical way. Yeah. Um, but ice warriors too. Ice warriors, yeah, yeah, and 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 also the you know, advances in technology where we might be able to control or prevent this sort of yeah. thing. You know, there's a lot of talk when we talk about terraforming planets like Mars about ways to warm up the planet. And we can use what we learned from the industrial revolution to do that. You can pollute the heck out of Mars in order to increase the density of the atmosphere and the density of greenhouse gases. Uh, and that's been often posited. It wouldn't make for breathable air, but at least if the air pressure was a little bit close to earth normal, it would be easier to wear some of the suits and things. Um, and adding a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere would certainly warm things up. We've seen that with the planet Venus. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you also have the Christmas episode of the Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe where you have trees being cut down just because they're there and they can be destroyed and the effect on the climate and the effect mm -hmm. on the trees so again that's a little bit more of environmental change yeah. on the planet and and some stories do a better job than others about carrying this message in a more subtle way mm -hmm. rather than beating you over the head with it <clears throat> orphan 55 uh, <laughs> yeah uh, and I, I think there's room to do more of this. I mean, um, we've talked about several stories, but, you know, there's been like 800 episodes of Doctor Who, you know, hundreds of stories of Doctor Who, and the cold has really only played into a small portion of them. Um, we could be setting episodes on the surface of icy moons like Europa. We could be setting things in other parts of the globe where it's colder, or we could be doing things, we could have a visit back to the ice ages and interacting with Neanderthals. Uh, there are stories that could be told that haven't been told yet in Doctor Who. And I realize that from a budget standpoint, trying to set it in cold weather creates complications, particularly when you're filming in August, uh, mm -hmm. but it could be done. Yeah. So The way they keep changing what Neanderthals look like, what the Dovians look like, mm -hmm. I think they're better off just staying away from that. Sure. Yeah. But sure. there are but other snow stories that can yeah. be told. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how about like. Uh, you could set something in Alaska. Well, yeah, I was going to say you could set yeah. something in Alaska or Greenland yeah. you know, or Iceland very easily. I mean, heck, uh, 
Captain Jack Harkness was from future a future Iceland that was quite a bit warmer than it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, but something even we we could do more with Vikings. You know, we we did see some Vikings in uh, the Time Edler, but let's see them at their height. You know, and and let's let's travel with them and and yes, being their climates. as being traders, not as being robbers and pillagers. Yeah. I mean, I guess we did a little bit with me. With yeah. the Sildor, but again, that was in a warmer climate there. Mm-hmm. But to see them, how how they dealt with the cold and all would be yeah. interesting. I mean, let, what if we had like an ice warrior story set in Norway? Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> and even like looking at indigenous populations and, and uh, histories and looking at maybe um, uh, like rescue missions that have happened mm-hmm. throughout history um, from the snow or um, Again, Doctor Who and the Daughter Party. <laughs> oh, my oh my God, that, that would be amazing. Uh, uh, but it, or like again, being a literary nerd, like meeting Jack London and being on his uh, expeditions and and adventures would be. You super know, that fun. would be a very Chris Chibnall story doing Jack London. I would think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Be, um. But we also, from what I know of contemporary Who, and maybe it's been touched on a little bit in, in classic Who, but they really don't talk a lot, or they there aren't episodes about, like, Everest. Like, Everest is a huge feat um, to, mm-hmm. to climb, and, and I feel like there's so much potential for stories at least on mountains or Everest or... Well, you know things like yeah, that. I think we had the abominable snowmen there in the yeah. Trouton era, but that's 1967. It's been a long time yeah. since we've revisited that. And the trouble is, when you're doing different cultures, that gets a leather, rather, rather mm. yeah. I suppose you don't want to do them incorrectly, like has been yeah. done at times yeah. over the years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think I think shying away from that is not. A good enough reason not to do it if you do mm-hmm. it respectfully if you do it with intent and and with advice i think you can do it you just need to be respectful about it but the trouble is everest is usually rich people imposing upon native guides and again you're starting to get into the oh well why Jim can't there be a story about that yeah why can't there be a story about these rich people manipulating and and taking advantage of the native pot like i think that that could be a really interesting episode um, you know uh, i agree what about though where we wouldn't have to get quite so culture there's a lot of periods of history set in cold climbs that are quite important uh mm-hmm. 1940 russia mm-hmm. you know the, the russians and the nazis fighting in that extreme cold and and We've seen the doctor get caught up in the reign of terror in France. We've seen the doctor and, and friends get caught up in Nero's period in Rome. Why couldn't they get caught up in, on the Eastern Front there in World War II? Why couldn't they be in Siberia dealing with something? We, we spent a lot of time in the West, not as much time in these other parts of the world. But we did now have the Crimean War with some time yeah. instead of Russia. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 But there weren't Russians, there were Santarans. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and just wouldn't it be fun to go back to the Ice Age, though, Ice Ages, and, you know, we've had the doctor riding a dinosaur in a spaceship. Why couldn't he be riding a mammoth? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. I mean, we've, we've, they've done those for primeval, so I know the CGI exists in Britain mm-hmm. for this. So and Paul Cornell wrote that story, if I remember correctly, with the mammoth or mastodon going down one of the main highways in Britain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. We could visit um, Laura Ingalls Wilder, more closer to, to our home. Although we get some more cringiness there. Oh, yeah. As history has shown us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But certainly, yeah, there were some good winters in Minnesota back mm-hmm. then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we're we've talked quite a bit uh on this we've, um, we've we talked about my the, list yeah, yeah we've talked about the past the below zero stories we kind of talked about the future um suppose we just probably put some last thoughts together and wrap this up soon so 
Anything else you want to say on the below zero topic? It's nice when they actually make it believable that it's mm -hmm. cold. It's rather head scratching when like the first one I mentioned where you've got, oh yeah, you've got skin wrapped around your shoulders. Your legs are bare. Sorry, mm -hmm. you're frozen. Mm -hmm. So when they actually take into account what cold actually does to the human body, it's um i'd love to see more where the cold is affecting things like electronics um we have plenty of space set stories you know and depending on where you are in space it could be quite cold mm -hmm. you know uh the the space in and around near pluto is at about 30 kelvin which is about minus 240 degrees celsius and minus quite a bit more fahrenheit Pluto itself is a little bit warmer uh, for various reasons, but deep space is cold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your electronics have got to be able to deal with that. Your sensors on your spacecraft, whatever. These are things that we have to think about with things like our Voyager spacecraft. Extreme cold temperatures you're dealing with there. Um, it'd be interesting to see that play more into plots. Um, not necessarily the TARDIS affected by the cold, but you know they land on a ship and they're helping them out and they're having problems mm -hmm. because of this or that. Um, also, just on the surface of worlds, you know, we we mostly stick to Earth and Earth-like worlds. But what if you were to land on a Pluto-like object and have to do something there on the surface in a heated spacesuit and all the the complications thereof? This is something mm -hmm. that I think the Expanse TV series has handled well. That is just how deadly space can be and doctor who's touched on it a few times but mm -hmm. it could be done more okay and we'll probably do you want to mention the fact that we are all of us are found on other panels at this convention yeah, i think that was yeah, the last thing we're going to do yeah so yeah promote what you want to promote <laughs> kathy why don't you start uh well i'll be on i don't know when this is actually going to be air cute creatures and sci-fi and the new year special panel and i've got a few other panels that i'll be on traveling with the doctor and social politics and doctor who so i can be found at the convention too so i will be in the artist alley mm. and karina and um i will be on several panels uh i was also on the flux uh panel um but I will be part of Harry Potter Child Stars on, or Child Actors, sorry, uh, on Friday. On Saturday, I'm going to be with uh, Kathy uh, in Traveling with the Doctor, uh, pe the People versus Clara Oswald. That will be a um, very fun debate. Uh, and then Dr. Horror, Horror. Um, and then on Sunday, I am uh, going to be uh, talking about teaching with Doctor Who. Uh, which will be a very fun and interesting panel. So come see me. I'll be I'll be on site uh, at the convention. And I'm on a bunch. Uh, I, I will be virtual with the con again this year. I'll be broadcasting here from home. But uh, I've got five pre-recorded panels, including this one. And I will also be transmitting in live on main stage at 345 Sunday with 50 years of season nine. And that'll be an interesting technical feat, having a mixture of in-person and virtual panelists. Uh, curious to see how that'll go. And I'll hang out in the Discord a lot during the convention. So if you guys want to chat with me there, you know, go ahead. I'm, I've gotten pretty active on Discord in the last year or two because of a game I play called Marvel Strike Force. And so, um, yeah, I'll hang out in there and you guys can chat with me about whatever. Uh, Lego, Marvel Strike Force, whatever. <laughs> Science, I don't care. We're good. Um, Yes, yeah, so everyone, uh, thank you for being at the panel. Console Rooms uh, 2022 Satellite 9 is still in full swing. And uh, stay warm out there. <laughs> yeah. Bye, everyone. See ya.